So I am going to talk about gastrointestinal disease. And originally I thought I'd focus more on diseases. And then I thought, well, unless you guys have had biology any time in the near past, it probably is a good idea to go ahead and talk a little bit about the gastrointestinal tract and the variety of animals that we fund. And so we'll do some fun stuff. So it's going to be really easy. It's not going to be any heavy duty science, but I have good pictures, including pictures of unusual poop because um, I like poop. Uh, you know, we talk a little, just to talk a little bit and about gastrointestinal tract disease, even though it's not always an area of funding that we've done a lot of work in, that we have done some, it remains one of the primary reasons people see, seek veterinary care. So a lot of it, you know, if we think of the top reasons, it's vaccines and some routine health care. But things like vomiting and diarrhea are some of the most common reasons that people seek uh, out veterinary assistance. And I think if any of us have had dogs and cats, we know that that uh, is not an uncommon problem. So it's kind of interesting. It causes a lot of disease, usually not a lot of bad disease, and, but it is a very, very common problem. So moving on, today's program, we're going to talk a little bit about parts of the gastrointestinal tract. Many of these will be familiar because we share them and then there are some we don't. Uh, cool differences between species. I, by training, my subspecialty is gastroenterology, so find it very, very, very interesting. Um, what does each part do all day? Then we're going to look at pictures of poop just because it's kind of interesting and why it's important. And then we'll finish with nasty diseases. And this kind of sounds like, I thought, like a Jeopardy categories, like <laughs> nasty diseases for 400. Anyway. Um, Let's get started. And again, I'm not going to take a huge amount of time, but let's talk a little bit about the parts of the gastrointestinal tract. And for my first diagram, I am going to use the dog to begin. And anybody can stop me whenever you want. And when we think about the digestive system, one thing that I want to point out that one of my professors once drew was they basically put, made a box with a hole at one end and a tube and a hole at the other end. And so the gastrointestinal tract is really unique in that it's really isolated from the rest of the body. Gets blood, it's obviously contained within our skeleton and our skin, but it's almost like its own system, right? And we know there's lots and lots and lots of bacteria that live there. I'm not gonna do a lot on the gut microbiome, but a lot of those are separated. Now, the problem with this dog's digestive tract is that his stomach is in his chest. This is not drawn to scale. Your stomach and your liver are not up here, but they kind of spread things out. Uh, and we need to remember that the digestive system actually starts in our mouth. So. We have teeth that grind stuff up. Um, we have enzymes in our saliva that begin digestion. So it starts in the mouth, goes through the esophagus, which is a tube that is actually muscular, and go, which empties into the stomach, which is beneath the diaphragm, right? So this esophagus goes through the thorax. And that's something to remember, because sometimes diseases of the chest can affect the esophagus. And sometimes diseases of the esophagus can present like chest pain in our animals. So once the esophagus empties in the stomach, which is below our rib cage and animals rib cage as well, and the liver is there, the stomach empties in the small intestine, liver, gallbladder, pancreas all contribute digestive enzymes to the process. And then it goes to the large intestine and then out. A slightly better diagram of the more business end of the uh, intestinal tract is, again, so this is a front to back view of a dog. Esophagus comes in the stomach, which sits like this. The liver's kind of here. Um, the first part of the small intestine is the duodenum or duodenum, however you want to say it. The next part is the jejunum, and there's lots and lots and lots of jejunum. And then the very terminal part of the small intestine is the ileum, which empties into the colon. The cecum is here. Cecum size varies between individuals. And if this were a human, your little appendix would be right off the edge of the cecum. Um, then, of course, the colon and then out. This is a picture of the pancreas in the dog, which has two lobes like a big V. Um, kind of boring. So our next relative or closest, and many people say pigs are closer to people, but 
they're actually pretty close to dogs. They're very, very, have very similar construction, except for one thing, which is they have the most bizarre, well, not the most bizarre, but an interesting large intestine. It's called a spiral colon, and it looks like this. And I used to remember in vet school that they have curly tails and they have curly colons. So uh, if you want to be interesting at cocktail parties, you can say, Pigs have this really interesting <laughs> large intestine. But otherwise, they're, they're a lot like us and a lot like dogs and a lot like cats. Now we get into something a little interesting. This looks like something my kids would have drawn, like color in the large intestine purple. So uh, cows and um, ruminants in general are a very interesting group of animals. And we're now getting into a little bit more elaborate digestive tracts. So we all know. Animals graze, they eat grass, they eat stuff we can't eat and digest it. Well, we could eat grass, but you know, it'll just kind of come out the other end looking pretty much the same way I went in. Um, other animals are able to utilize that and they're divided roughly into two major categories, what are called foregut fermenters and hindgut fermenters. And we're gonna talk about a little bit of each. Cattle are the classic foregut fermenters. And how many people here learned cows have four stomachs? They don't really have four stomachs, right? They have four compartments to their stomach, which are really interesting. So cows obviously have mouths even though they have teeth, even though this guy looks like he doesn't have any teeth. So they do chew. And we know that cows, they don't burp. They eructate and they don't vomit. That's called eructation when they go bleh and they burp, right? And they get it in their mouth and they chew their cud. And they keep doing that over and over and over again. The first part of their four compartment stomach, um, even though this is not quite to scale, we think of is the rumen. And it's a giant fermentation vat. So think of Coors, Budweiser, giant fermentation vat full of bacteria, which are helping digest all that stuff that we can't digest. The reticulum is this really little interesting compartment. It's honeycombed and it catches stuff like cows eat little rocks, certain forms of material that they can't digest. Pieces of nail, I've seen nails, wires, everything in the reticulum and they actually get an interesting disease cleverly named hardware disease, which um, is when sometimes these things pierce through the, uh, through the reticulum. But the reticulum catches some of that stuff. The omasum is another really interesting organ. And as you know, the rumens are gallons and gallons, they're huge. And, um, but you don't want all of that fluid dumping into your rest of your intestinal tract. So the omasum actually has these folds. And it looks like folds of a book, if you think of leaves of a book. And its job is to reabsorb a lot, a lot of fluid. And then the abomasum is what we would call the true stomach. So eventually everything ends up in the abomasum and digestion proceeds apace, just like everybody, everybody else. They have a little bit bigger cecum than we do, small intestine, large intestine, doesn't look like a radiator, um, but uh, anyway, and then rectum and out, and we all know what cow poop looks like. So now the horse, the horse is, does their business end of digestion is actually the other end. So they are hindgut fermenters. So they eat lots of grass and stuff and it passes all the way through to this enormous, and I do mean enormous, complex, large intestine. And we'll talk a little bit about it because this is where horses get in trouble all the time with things known as colic, which we'll talk about colic a bit. It's usually part because of the large intestine. So they eat their stuff. Some digestion does occur in the stomach. Things go in the small intestine. But then where their fermentation spot is their hind gut. So we have four gut fermenters. Those are deer, sheep, goats, cattle, antelope, you know, moose, mule deer. Um, they all are four gut fermenters. They're ruminants. Hind gut fermenters are horses, Elephants are actually hindgut fermenters, rabbits. Um, just a word about llamas. Camelids actually have their pseudo ruminants. They have a three chamber kind of foregut where their little fermentation takes place. So being, they have to be different. And they have three compartments that have 
similar but not but different, um, helpfully labeled C1, C2, and C3. Um, so they're, they're a little different. I did not learn about camelids when I was in vet school. Let me kind of skip that part. This is um, the crazy complex large intestine of the horse. And again, it, when we think about colic in the horse, this stuff gets like all crazy and turned around sometimes, and, but it's reachable through this way. Um, so a lot of times when you're in vet school, you learn like this should be over here and the left side should be here. And you try to figure out like if something's not in the right place. But it's very, very complex and much different than a lot of the other species that we talk about. OK, so we've talked a little bit about that. And we'll talk about what are the parts of the gastrointestinal tract do all day. This is for people who have small children and have Richard Scarry's What Do People Do All Day? Um, it's a reference to that great book, which will keep your kids occupied and you reading about a thousand times. I could tell you what the postman does. So anyway, let's go through this really quickly. Again, I tried to skip through some of what it does, but we said about the oral cavity is where digestion actually starts with digestion of carbohydrates in because you have amylase in your saliva. Then this goes down the esophagus, and the esophagus is not just a passive tube. It actually has muscle in it. And you know this because we have all done this, even when I was a meat eater, how many people have eaten a too big piece of steak, you swallow it and you feel that pain in here, right? That is your esophagus pushing as hard as it can to push something down into your stomach. When dogs and cat, cats never get stuff in their esophagus, though I have pulled out a couple foreign bodies, but dogs do, and they often present with chest pain because they're feeling those really, really painful contractions as the esophagus is trying to get that bone which is stuck and is not going to go in the stomach, in the stomach. So they often look funny. They'll come for back pain because they're hunched over. So again, remembering that the esophagus goes to the thorax. The stomach, we know that the pH is really low there, right? Protein digestion um, takes place primarily in the stomach because of the low pH, right? A very acidic environment we take and acids to make our little stomachs feel better. Um, the stomach empties into the small intestine. The liver and gallbladder deliver bile through a bile duct into the small intestine, usually really close to where the pancreatic duct comes in. And there's a little bit of variation, but we're all kind of set up the same way. Those uh, organs deliver hormones that are important in digestion, and the pH changes to more neutral or basic pH. And this presents problems when we think about the bacteria that live in different areas and del delivery of probiotics. Because if you give a probiotic of a, something that loves pH neutral or basic and you dump it right into a big giant pit of hydrochloric acid, which is basically what your stomach is, the question is, can bacteria survive there? So that's a big um, thought right now on how to deliver probiotics sometimes to different areas. Those of you can remember the old enteric coated, still have them, aspirin. The idea was that it would be not dissolved until it got into the neutral pH of the gastrointestinal tract. The problem is you can get duodenal ulcers. So you bypass the stomach and then get a duodenal ulcer sometimes with your um, NSAIDs. So the small intestine goes long, the duodenum, lots of digestion. And then the main business of the small intestine, though, is not just digestion, but that's where all your nutrients are absorbed, right? So everything is absorbed there. We now know that the intestine is very important in lots of other things, mainly mediated by the gut microbiome. Then you get into the large intestine. In the large intestine, at least in our dogs and cats and us, fluid is reabsorbed. We make stool. It's also a repository storage area for stool. And then out it comes. Bonus organs. So there are some bonus organs. We already talked about them. One is the, the um, rumen, reticulum omasum and abomasum of the ruminant and um, kind of the, all that, I guess the spiral colon is kind of a bonus organ. But um, the three-chambered stomach of the camelid and then the big, giant, 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 giant large intestine of the hindgut ferment, fermenters. Okay, so as pro promised, pooparama. So everybody has to, so this is our little humorous break. Um, what is that, what animal? Yell it out. Yell it out. Cow. 
Everybody should know what a cow patty looks like. Um, you probably have stepped in them. Um, the litter is a giveaway. Sorry, I couldn't find it without litter. So that's cat. We helpfully described on this website as Tootsie Rolls. So, or as my husband calls them, because our dog eats some breath mints. <laughs> so, and that's pretty normal, right, stool for a cat. What are those? Horse, Horse right? Or actually, elephant kind of looks like this too, right? Hindgut ferment fermenters tend to look a little bit like this. Now, bonus, cuboidal poop. Who makes cuboidal poop? Wombats. Wombats, yes, yes, well done. I thought nobody would get that. I saw an article that said, we have now figured out how wombats make cuboidal poop, but I did not. Okay, and the very, the very last one, not a bird, because there are no birds on here, green poop that supposedly is made into tea. Panda poop. So panda poop made into tea. Okay, so <laughs> so that's our that's our little that's our little break for today. So um, anyway, our pooparama. However, you should pay attention to particularly your animals' poop because it actually tells those of us who are gastroenterologists an awful lot about their their GI health. So as promised, a few nasty diseases, and we will be done done early. So things cats don't need besides love or affection or um, any other human being in their life. They don't need colons. There's actually a colon under don't need, so there's a little, a little pun there. Um, they actually don't need their colon. Um, megacolon is a condition of cats. It's fairly frequent. When I was in school, we were just recognizing it. It's thought to be an, an unfortunate side effect as a, of us keeping them inside more, and they're more sedentary. So they can get um, constipation and then very large problems with stool, and their colon becomes so big that it stops contracting. So we're going to all learn a little bit about x-rays. This is helpfully labeled. This is just how they come. No, they don't come out this way. So this is the heart, the diaphragm. There's the liver. Uh, when we look at organs on an x-ray, we're looking at different densities. So you guys can see bone. It's really white. So there's the spine, the ribs. Um, ooh, like I touch it and it bleeds. Did you see that? Like I made red dots. Oh, that's freaky. Um, oh, I guess because it's on here, but it's like red dots. So fat, I'll try not to touch it because it's freaking me out. Um, kidneys, and here's the large intestine with some poop in it, which is, are those things. Urinary bladder, lots of small intestines all over the place. Uh, this is what a cat with megacolon looks like. This is its entire colon with giant pieces of poop. I love the helpful red arrow in case you can't figure <laughs> out there's something wrong in this cat. Um, we don't have real good feeling how it happens. However, cats absolutely do not need their colons. You just take out their entire intestinal tract. They don't get little colostomy bags. As long as you can prefer, preserve the ileocecal-colic junction where the large, small intestine goes into the large intestine, you hook it to the rectum and they are good to go, mm -hmm. period. End of story. They do great. They don't have diarrhea. They produce normal poop. Nobody really understands why. You cannot do that to a person, nor can you do that to a dog. If a dog gets megacolon, and luckily it is rare, um, it is bad, bad, bad news. N I don't know that anyone exactly knows why this is a peculi peculiarity of cats. You try to prevent this usually with high fiber diets, you know what I mean, making sure that they're making regular stool, all the things that we do maybe for our cats indoors, like keep them trim, keep them active as much as possible. But it's a condition that we actually have done some work on here at Morris because there are a class of drugs that were kind of worked on or came into veterinary medicine in the 90s that are prokinetics and one of them actually helps the colon contract with the idea that if you can keep it from getting distended you can and keep things moving you can prevent this condition from happening 
changing the diet, actually, even though you think of constipation, but high fiber diets actually help keep things moving a bit. But the prevention is the best. I've actually seen this once in an ocelot kept in an apartment in New York City um, that got megacolon. But it is a, a condition, again, that is pretty common. It's usually older cats, interestingly, males more than females. And um, it's something that we work try very hard to prevent, and we've done some work on in morphs. So nasty disease one, nasty disease two, canine parviral viral enteritis, which I just did a blog on, so everybody go read it. But um, we know that parvovirus, this particular virus, mutated probably from cat feline panleukopenia virus and blew up in about 1978, hit worldwide, which is kind of interesting, almost simultaneously. And it, there's a canine parvovirus one. It had been around for a long time, but that was not the source of this mutation that became so deadly. It was canine parvovirus two from feline panleukopenia virus. It was a worldwide pandemic. All dogs that got infected, all dogs that came in contact with the virus were infected. Nobody had any natural immunity. It was particularly de deadly, of course, to puppies. It's an extremely hardy virus in the environment. There are dogs that now have some natural immunity, but not very many. Um, and we know that it exists and is still a big problem and you can carry it home on your shoes. So when these patients come into the hospital, they need strict, strict, strict quarantine. It is. By the estimates I've seen, 9% of dogs that are treated outpatient or conservatively will survive, so 91% die. If they're hospitalized with aggressive therapy, 95% live. And we rarely lost a puppy that I was able to hospitalize and people had the bucks to pay for treatment, but it is hard and it is costly versus a vaccine, which is very, very, very effective. Some subtypes, there's canine pyrovirus A, B, and C. C is the latest mutation from 2000. However, the, the current um, parvovirus vaccine is very, very effective, even against these new varieties that crop up. However, there could come a day when it will mutate again and be um, a big problem for our dog population. It is, I think, one of those diseases we don't see very much anymore. I was actually, I hate to date myself, I was a teenager when this hit in 78. And I mean, it was all over the news because dogs were dying um, from it or very, very, very sick if they happened to be adults. But it is still really devastating to puppies. Um, and your puppies are susceptible as you're in your vaccine series. So you need to be diligent about doing that and you need to be careful about taking them again to parks because a dog can be completely asymptomatic. It's still out there, but they can shed it in their, in their stool. So bad disease number two. Yes. What? What happens? Yeah, so that's a good question. So parvovirus, Parvo means tiny. So these are really, really small viruses. They have a predilection for rapidly dividing cells. And where do you have lots of rapidly dividing cells? Your gut, right? Because your gut's constantly turning over. It's one of the most rap, even as adults. Oh, yeah, you just made some more cells. So we all make cells constantly. I mean, they're just, um, because as, as you eat, stuff gets kind of sloughed off. So again, that's why the virus loves to, first of all, you take it in orally, but it has a predilection for the intestinal cells. Another area where it has a predilection is bone marrow cells. Another area where you have lots and lots and lots, even if you're an adult, rapidly dividing cells. And that's why one of the things we see with this is very low white counts. Terrible name, well, they named it parvovirus, that's okay, enteritis. But if you know feline pan leukopenia, pan means all leuko white cells. So they also get incredibly low white cell counts, and pan leukopenia is an intestinal disease. Also known as feline distemper, which is a terrible name because it has nothing to do with canine distemper. So 
all this confusing stuff, but, um, but the, this looks almost identical to panleukopenia and vice versa. And right now, you guys know, we're having a resurgence of feline panleukopenia for reasons that are unclear for about the last 10 or 15 years globally. And it's a big, a big problem in shelters, and which always makes me worry that it will hop again or mutate. Uh, differently into dogs. But that's why you see the GI signs, because they're just sloughing their intestinal tract. Um, and you see low white counts, which is really bad because your gut's full of bacteria, right? So if you're sloughing and you don't have a good protective barrier and bacteria leak into your bloodstream, all of us can handle that. If we go and get our teeth cleaned, we get a nice healthy dose of bacteria into our bloodstream, but our body can handle it. But these guys, they're babies, they they're, have immature immune systems to begin with, and then you give them no white cells. And what these patients typically die of is sepsis because they get an overwhelming um, bacterial infection in their blood, and then it seeds the other organs. Uh, so anyway, that is a particularly nasty disease. We know at Morris, we've done a lot of early work on parvovirus. And I've been working on this a lot. And the good news is I'm finding that we were one of the first players giving lots of money to Cornell University, which was sort of ground zero for looking at this and talking with some of the folks who were there. They would People would send them dead puppies in the mail, which sounds gross, uh, just to see if they could isolate viruses, because they were known to be um, isolating a lot of new viruses. And they, so we contributed to the isolation of the virus, um, one of the first diagnostic tests, and the deve eventual development of the vaccine. Um, so it was really cool. It was a collaborative effort. There were a few other people, but we gave them, at the time, like a $50,000 grant, which was no chump change in 1979. So it was a pretty big investment and um, powered the lab there, helped power the lab for several years. And they were doing all the work that eventually led to a vaccine. So pretty cool. It's a good story for us. And it, um, so and we were right there at the beginning. So colic. I just wrote colic up there. So colic is like horses and babies, right? We talk about, and horses are babies. Anyway, um, it's just a general term for abdominal discomfort. And it's a very, very common condition in horses. As you guys know, if you were at the last board meeting, Christy looked into, um, you know, it, it tends to be a very, very high on the list of equine practitioners as far as a concern for them. They see a lot of horses with colic. And it can range. It's just really a, a lump term for gastrointestinal distress. Sometimes it can be treated with medically, you know, with some fluids. Uh, sometimes it requires surgery, which if you think of like that giant, like large intestine, I've seen that come out of a horse in surgery. It is not trivial to do that. And a lot of dog or a lot of dogs, a lot of horses don't survive colic surgery, but they were gonna die anyway. They can get um, twists, they can get hernias, they can get entrapments, they can get like I just ate something naughty and it'll eventually pass through. Uh, but it can sometimes be a surgical, a surgical problem. And we have done a fair amount of work in colic, though, again, if you saw Christie's presentation, we um, don't invest as much in colic as the equine profession identifies it as a very, very important problem um, for a variety of reasons. Again, how can we get horses to survive surgery? more effectively? Um, how can we diagnose it a little bit better? Are there ways, better ways of treating it medically so that it doesn't become a surgical problem? And, but there are lots and lots and lots of causes of colic, just like there are lots of causes of colic in babies. Um, so again, it's sort of a, a lump term, but a very, very important problem in horses and a very, um, very nasty disease. So that was, I know, a quick romp through, but I did make it under at 30 minutes. So if you guys have any questions, I'm happy to answer. I know that was pretty quick and not very in-depth scientifically, but I thought it would be fun to just, it's summer, we'll take it easy and, and take a look at some of, um, again, understanding the differences in GI tracts when we talk about them and why different things are important. So does anybody have any questions? Nobody has any questions? I have no idea what an otter has. It's probably, um, <laughs> I know they're not hindgut or, or um, foregut fermenters, so they probably are a lot like other um, 
carnivores. So. Kelly, how long did it take to develop a vaccine from the time Parvo was introduced? That's a pretty good question. Um, probably about two or three years from when people first recognized it. But I had a great talk with doc, this guy, Dr. Colin Parrish. Colin well, happened to be a graduate student at Cornell. He's now like the head of the whole thing. And he said they were, they did some really rodeo stuff, but he said because of our funding contributing with other people's funding and it was so massive, they were able to probably save millions of dogs lives because they were able to get a vaccine out faster. But they tried a couple different vaccines. They actually tried the feline panleukopenia vaccine, which is the FVRCP we give all of our cats. There's a panleukopenia cone. So they tried that, didn't work. There's a mink panleukopenia virus vaccine. They tried that. You're like, they're just desperate, right? They're like trying stuff. And then they did, they went to actually people's clinics and just experimented on dogs. People were coming in, there was no vaccine, and they did all their prototype vaccines, uh, several of them they tried in, just went right to the clinic. No trials, just right to the clinic, and were able to show efficacy. And then they refined it over several years. So by the mid 80s, it was, you know, I mean, similar to the parvovirus vaccine with a few little tweaks over the years. But it took a couple years because they had to identify the virus. Um, and then they were trying to figure out, well, where, what's the best So when you think of a virus, right, we'll just think of a ball is like, when we get exposed to a virus, there are things on the virus that stimulate our immune system, right, called epitopes, and which is kind of simplistic. But anyway, there are ones we react to and ones that we don't, right? So they're trying to figure out what's the best one on here that's going to stimulate the most vigorous immune response. And also, like, you know, if we give a killed virus versus a, what's called a modified live virus. Your body reacts much better to a, a live virus that's just been tweaked, so it's not gonna cause disease. However, the problem with that is, right, you could have somebody get infected and have the disease. Um, then, or you kill the virus, right? Like things like rabies, we temp tend to have killed viruses because we don't ever wanna have like a modified live virus with that, right, because of that cause disease, we'd all be in a lot of trouble. So they were playing around with that for a while, trying to figure out which was maybe the best way to stimulate. And they had to grow the virus in cultures. And um, so it was really interesting. I talked to Dr. Parrish, and he said they actually had virus preserved that's now 40 years old that they just looked at, and they sequenced the whole thing. Because they wanted to compare the virus from 1979 to the sequences of the mutations A, B, and C since then. Because A came about not within a, like three or four years. It had already mutated um, and was problematic. And so that was really the basis for the most effective vaccine is after that first mutation to A. Um, and then it kind of got it under control. But it's a pretty interesting story. But it seems like we had a good hand in a lot of the basic research. Uh, AKC actually fundraised specifically around it. So they fundraised for this disease that was killing dogs and gave money to them. And then, of course, Norton was in on it because they wanted vaccine, right? They're a vaccine company. So they also put money into, into the initial research. Any other questions? GI questions. Like, I can guess what other animals may have, you know, if they're hindgut or foregut fermenters, so. <laughs> guess the, guess the, guess where the Dolphin. poop comes from. Dolphins are, don't, are like, um, you know, pigs and dogs because they don't ferment, right, anything. They're all carnivores are pretty sim simple or omnivores because a pig's an omnivore, we're omnivores. Dogs technically are kind of omnivores. Cats are obviously carnivores, but. Chickens? Oh, chickens, totally different. They have gizzards and crops, and they do. They're really, really different, right? Their gizzard is their grinding organ. Their crop is kind of like their true stomach. Jean, Jean would know this better than me. And they don't, remember, everything empties together. So their urinary tract, your genital, genital tract, and their poop all comes out in one little white blob, because it all, and it all, um, empties into the cloaca, right? And then they poop out of there. So they have, they're very different because they just, they have a, a communal sort of place where everything empties into. 
<laughs> right. So what can horses do while walking, pee or poop? There's one that they have to stop for and one that they can do while walking. They can poop while walking, but they have to stop to pee. So, and I think cows can do either. I don't know. So I, uh, so sheep are another sheep are another um, for gut fermenter. They have exactly the same configuration as do goats, as do cows, as do moose and deer, and you know, all those guys. You find little tiny pellets, except for cows, which is interesting because they have cow patties. They don't really have the little neat poops that a lot of the other for for gut fermenters. Now rabbits are hind gut fermenters, and they have nice little little pellets too. Firmer, right. And deer can look different on different times of the year, right? So they get looser at different times of the year and more like their little little nibbins other times of the year. All right, you are all excused. And I got under the time limit. Thank you for coming.